Okay, um, welcome to the Spine Conference. Today's discussion is recurrent metastatic carcinoma to the lumbar spine. And um, let's see if I can get this thing to work. Uh, just like every conference, um, I don't know everything, and I may say something wrong, and I apologize in advance. I'm just doing my best. And if you guys think I said something wrong or you'd like to add something, please interrupt me right away so that we can learn from each other. So this is a, um, I, I like case-based learning. Case we had, I think three weeks ago, four weeks ago, 81-year-old woman with a chief complaint of low back pain. She noticed over the last five weeks she has diffuse uh, low back pain. Prior to five weeks ago, she was absolutely fine. She was admitted to Upper Chesapeake uh, uh, four weeks ago for two days, February 11th to 13th, um, where she had a CAT scan. And she was referred back to me because I did her first surgery. She was told she had a recurrent tumor, and the radiation oncologist said she cannot have radiation. So she was given steroids, and she returns back to see me. She has chronic low extremity numbness in her legs from her previous surgery in 2015, and we're going to go through that surgery. And her, um, I had done the previous surgery, so we're going to go over these x-rays in a second. But um, where's Jessica? What do, you, what do you see on these x-rays? This so that's the AP lateral of the kind of the... It looks like the lumbar, lumbar. spine demonstrating. <laughs> um, this crack or lumbar fusion um, looks like it's from T10 to um, L3. Does anything look wrong just off the bat? Quickly? Yeah, the L1 uh, vertebral body just looks, doesn't have like defined cortical edges. Looks like there's some destruction of the... Not as white, right, yeah. as the other ones. It's a subtle finding, though. Okay. Let's go back in time. And to 2015, when uh, Barack Obama was still the president. And this is not the patient, but it looks very similar um, to her. At that time, she was a 78-year-old woman with a T12 metastatic lesion. And her chief complaint to me was, my legs don't work. These, these are, those are her exact words. Uh, she um, went to the emergency room with ataxia. Her legs felt like she was detached from her body. She was falling, stumbling. She was referred by the oncologist. She had low back pain two months prior. She went to an urgent care. She had a CAT scan, which showed an abnormality. A bone scan showed a T12 lytic lesion. And I'm going to show you all these studies. Uh, she had a CT guided biopsy. All this was before she saw me and a PET scan. Her past medical history, she had a right upper lobe lobectomy three years prior, August 2012, which showed squamous cell carcinoma. She had COPD. She had a TIA, bilateral total knee replacement, right rotator cuff repair. She quit cigarette smoking, I want to say like 10 years prior. She was, so this is 2012. This is three years before her initial presentation, and she had a right upper lobe lesion, like a speculated lesion, which was resected, and she had no other meds. So this is the officers of 2015, the x-rays, AP lateral. So we know something's at T12. I, mean, I didn't see anything obvious. Uh, I'm going to move because there's a lot that we have to discuss. Um, so here's the AP lateral lumbar spine against 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So T12 looks... Pretty, pretty normal. And the CAT scan, um, sagittal cuts. What do you see here, Jessica? Um, so the 12th body, which is very kindly labeled, um, there is uh, destruction of the posterior elements, psycholytic um, process. Kind of yeah, like. posterior spinous process, right? And uh, how about the body? Does it look okay? That's um, it, if you want to point. Oh, it doesn't show up on the screen. It's okay. I tried. So fun yeah, um, it would have been fun. The body looks relatively normal. Yeah, so it looks like a, the posterior spinous process of T12 has been eroded. And here's an axial cut. Do you see a lamina there? I uh, do not. Um, so this is the uh, triple phase bone scan. Um, and what do you see there? Um, <clears throat> So I think in the um, third from the uh, right, you can see some subtle enhancing it, probably T12. And I, I don't know why this is, but why is it why is it that on the far right, it's a lot brighter than the third one? Why is it that you can see it very bright on that view, which I think is the PA view versus the AP view? I don't know. Maybe Samir can tell us, or do you know? Well, you mean why is it brighter on all of the right? Yes. Because when the camera is picking up the, uh, the reactivity, it's closer to the camera. So it's kind of look much, much brighter. 
the frontal view, you know, you're you're just not going to pick up as much signal. So you're the patient's laying right up against the, the the sensor, basically. Yeah. So when it comes to the spine, is it always like that? The posterior. Um, when I mean, it depends on where the lesion is. If it's more posterior, and you're looking at it from posterior, it can be brighter. Mm-hmm. And if you're looking at it from the anterior, it's not going to be as as bright. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, that's that's a typical uh, thing you can you can that. Okay. So uh, this is a close up of the same images, which shows T12 lights up, but nothing else lit up. So this patient had a CT guided uh, fine needle biopsy, and just in general. Uh, the accuracy of these biopsies are a lot better, 93% uh, versus 76% if it's lytic versus sclerotic, which, um, Dr. Beth, does that make sense to you, those numbers? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, when you're going after a lesion, if it's a lytic lesion, the vast majority of what you're going to see is probably tumor. Um, a sclerotic lesion means that the tumor is <clears throat> inducing you know, scar tissue or new bone formation, say in the case of an osteoblastic lesion. So when you're going after the lesion, there may be things kind of uh, precluding you from getting a best you know, tumor, actually, because there's other things in the, uh, in the, the specimen. Itself. Correct. Yeah. Okay, so um, so just the PET scan, I'm going to do this quickly. You can see on the right, that's, the, that's where the PET scan is, and on the left, that's the PET scan itself in the thigh. And um, it went from mid-thigh all the way up, so everything was negative. Up until the top one with the arrow is, you can see the it lit up at T12, and everything else was negative, and this just shows you T12 lit up. Same thing. So the MRI. What do you see on the MRI, Jessica? So you can see um, demonstration of what looks like a, a tumor, uh, the posterior elements of T12. It's um, heterogeneous, and it does look like it's causing. Um, it's encroaching on the spinal cord. I don't think it's causing Frank compression. Don't see any. Yeah, I don't know who Frank is, but I think that thing's crooked, don't you think? So it's so doing it's something. Crooked, yeah, but compression, I thought at least from was uh, edematous changes in the cord causing, you know, actual cord compression. But let's just keep it simple. It's doing something to the cord, yeah. though, most okay. certainly. Okay. Well, wait a second. You mentioned it shows tumors, so can you describe what you mean by that? Yeah, so it, it just looks uh, it looks like there's a lesion um, in the posterior elements of T12 um, in the spinous process, the anterior aspect of the spinous process. It looks different from the um, bone surrounding it. Um, the margins aren't as clear on it. Um, it's so mixed we, densities. It's got some fluid within it. So there's high signal intensity in it, mm-hmm. and there's some intermediate intensity in it. And was this with or without contrast? Um, you know? This is a well, this is a satural T2, so you want to look at the T1. But one one thing to when you want to describe a lesion in this case, mm-hmm. look at the normal anatomy. So for example, you can see the dark posterior epidural, epidural the epidural space where the fat is, uh-huh. and then the dark line. So that's a dura. And if you follow down, what happens is you lose that normal fat. So there's a lesion there. So you, you see what I mean? So this is it right here. Talk, this is the normal fat yeah, right here? So that's normal fat. And then here there's no normal fat. And then you, you lose that. So that, that's how you can describe this. And then when you come down below the lesion. Like that's the lose, fat right there? Yeah, mm-hmm. that's the fat right. And the dura is a dark line. That's nice. So when you when you remove the ligament of flavum, you see that little bit of fat. That's what that's what he's showing. So if you want to look better. Let's see if I have T1. That's a T1. Yeah, you're right. Look at that. So the oh. intermediate signal intensity lesion of the T12 spinous process in my view. Okay, so this is a close-up view, fat suppression view. We have more to see, so that's why I'm kind of going fast. Axial cuts, what do you think of the axial cuts, uh, Jessica? Um, so it demonstrates the uh, process seen at T12, but also on the um, top left, it does look like it's in the L1 pedicle, the lesion. Almost, yeah. That's a foramen, so it's almost oh. there to the L1 pedicle. So what surgery should we do, guys? Uh, so I'll just do it quickly. So the thoracolobal junction is a point of stress. So... 
I uh, removed the tumor. These are my notes from the operation. I removed the tumor by removing all of 12, half of 11, superior portion of L1. And I uh, the, just assumed the 12 screw was really strong. I was really happy with it. And I think it was strong, not normally strong. It was some kind of blastic response to the tumor because a 78-year-old woman does not have strong bone like that. Um, but I had great fixation, so I, so I put another screw above it, and then I wanted to get four points left. Unfortunately, the right L2 screw fractured or was medial. I think it fractured. I was probably medial, and that's why it fractured. So I went down to three on the right so I could have four points, and I removed all the tumor. So does anybody have any questions? What, what they have done differently in this case? Did you get a radiation oncology consult? Yeah, so 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 it's a it's a um, yeah. And what was there? I didn't think radio surgery was an option. No. You remember why? Because there was spinal cord compression and symptoms. We're going to go over that. Why? So so this is the post op, and the question is. Does everyone here fuse metastatic spinal reconstructions? Is it unnecessary? Is it necessary? Um, what, what does anybody have any opinions? I can keep talking. But. This lady, metastatic lung carcinoma, 78 years old. Six months. Yeah. Less than a year, you probably don't have to fuse. More than a year prognosis, I think you'd want to probably throw some bone down there. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so, I mean, poor prognosis. 78-year-old woman, metastatic lung carcinoma. But, um, I mean, I fuse it almost every single time unless I think there's no way this person is going to survive more than a month or two. And the, and the way I look at it, I feel it's like just running out of ground ball. I'm always going to do a good job. I don't make a big deal out of it. I don't take a layer crest, but I use allograft. I drill out all the facets and fuse it. It takes me like 10 minutes. I may be wrong. Post-op, Cascan, T11 screws, T12 screws, they look kind of perfect, right? What they should look like. L1 screws, again, uh, I had to uh, put a screw in L3 because the pedicle fractured. So the patient went home post-op day one. She had some ileus. Then two weeks post-op, she had a pulmonary um, embolism, which you see there. And um, she never came back in follow-up. And quite frankly, I thought the patient basically went to hospice and passed away because she just never followed up. Um, Immediately post-op, uh, her pathology showed squamous cell carcinoma, and Dr. Beth is going to go over that. She had external beam radiation, a total of um, 3,000 centigrades, no chemotherapy, and I never saw her back. Um, so this is just um, a recent article about how the – for metastatic spine tumors from lung carcinoma, how long do they – what's the median survival? And group – a, uh, the group A is recent people because we have, uh, have uh, molecular targeted chemotherapy now and people live longer basically because of our chemotherapy. But in general, you can see by month, the 50 the fifty percent survival is about, is less than 10 months. Okay, so some time went by this year and she has been asymptomatic for three and a half years. I mean, this woman has been grocery shopping, driving. She forgot she had ever had cancer, and, except until recently. So here's the cask and uh, cask and what do you see here, Jessica? T11 screws. Um, so there's some uh, lucency around both of the screws. Why? Um, usually that's due to motion, so they've lost fixation. Um, some kind of motion. How about the 12 screws? Does look um, intact, well aligned. And what do you see here at L1? At L1, you see. Um, you uh, said you said L1 looked loosened, so now we have a CAT yes. scan. Yeah, so it does look like the um, right half of the vertebral body has. Um, Not there. Yeah. Where is Destructive it? process. I would, um, and with her history, probably a tumor. So here's your same T11 screws that you described. Twelve looks all right. What happened to the, what about the coronal sections here? So it does look like there's some involvement of the L2 vertebral body as well. Right. And the, what do you think of the three screw there on the? The three screw looks loose. So th uh, halo loosening at the right L3, half of L1's gone, some of L2. This is another sagittal cut. And 
most of L2 is intact, uh, but the pedicle, the right L2 pedicle is involved now with the CAT scan. And what do you think of the MRI? So this demonstrates um, uh, kind of a homogenous appearing um, tumor, again. L1 body. L1 body, half of L2. Um, okay. More posterior um, elements involved than appeared on the CAT scan. Yeah, you can see on the far right, some of the posterior elements are involved. And it goes into the pedicle of L2 and all of L1. How about the axial cut, L1? So yeah, demonstrating the... Um, the destruction or the um, tumor that is replaced right, by the body. Yeah. Remember, there was no, there was nothing there on the CAT scan, mm -hmm. so you can see it's all it looks like it's all soft tumor. It's eroded all the bone. What do you think of the spinal canal here, um, just below L1? This is at L1, L2 segment. Uh, so it looks pretty compressed. Yeah, so this is where so this is where it is, the spinal canal. So she definitely has uh, compression of her fecal sac. And this this uh, this mass just kind of like ripped through right through the facet very quickly and and stayed inside the bone. Do you have any, anybody have any theories why that is? It kind of it kind of um, it went very quickly through all the posterior elements. I think it's because she feels fused and it's just like a normal bone. So this tumor just went along the bone. I think the path of the bones. She How was do you fused. Know it went quickly. Uh, it did. See, years. see, this is my theory. See, it, I think it started. I kind of think of where's the epicenter. I think the epicenter was. Um, it didn't grow circumferentially. It kind of grew into the bone. Do you see that? It kind of crossed the facet instead of just growing circumferentially. Right. So I think it's because she's fused. Wait, how do you? Why do you think she's fused when her screws are loose? Yeah. So is she fused or not? Well, the only screws that were loose were. The facet is fused. Usually, cartilage is a barrier to tumor expansion. So, I mean, I think it's probably that the facet fused, and from the prior surgery, the tumor grew through that that area. I don't think otherwise you would usually have a demarcation right at the cartilage. My experience. Yeah, and and why is it? What is that on the uh, right at L two L three? I think it's necrotic tumor. So I'll just keep going just to be quick. So just a fat suppression image. And the rest of the thoracic spine was fine and cervical spine. So so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna pause again for everybody to talk about it, but this is my problem list right now, and you guys can add to it. 81 year old woman now. She has axial pain. Neurologically, she's fine. She has recurrent tumor, previous squamous cell. She's had a laminectomy T12 in the past. Now L1 is involved, 50% destruction of the L1 body. Pretty significant stenosis at L1, L2. Right L2 pedicle's gone. So there's questions in my mind. Does she have enough instrumentation right now for this tumor, T11, L3? The screws are loose at T11, L3, which tells you at some point in time those screws were moving. But the screws look solid at T12, L1, L2. Now, I didn't show you, but the rest of the CAT scan shows she's fused. But the right side's destroyed. The left side is solidly fused. So she has a solid fusion through the facets. And just so you know, how I do things is, is in every case, I'm very systematic about this. I take a high-speed burr, and I just go all the way through the taking cartilage, totally take it out, and then I pack that with bone. And I feel that fuses the facet every single time. I mean, it's best probability. So she fused, I think her, fu her facets are totally fused on the opposite side of the tumor. Um, so we have this defect at L102 anteriorly. Do we have to fill that with something? Do we need anterior support? So these are all the things in my mind. So let's, let's just go over. So any questions so far? We're going to go back to the case. But any questions so far? Okay, we'll just go quickly. So a third of people get cancer. So one third of us in this room are going to get cancer at some point in our lives probably. And in the state of Maryland, in 2018, there were 31,000 diagnoses of cancer, 10,000 deaths. We're a state of 6 million. So that's the, the whole county of Dorchester. As far as comparing us to the rest of the country, the rest of the country is 1 in 192, and we're a little bit higher, 1 in 161, as far as being diagnosed with uh, cancer, so we have a slightly higher rate. And uh, who gets lung cancer? <laughs> you don't have to be a cigarette smoker. Um, 60 to 65% of people never smoked or former smokers, and every day 422 Americans die from lung cancer. Um, lung cancer is uh, very deadly. 
uh, the middle pie chart is deaths, and you can see lung cancer is more than the other top three combined, colorectal, breast, prostate. So lung cancer is, is very deadly. Who gets lung cancer? Occupational uh, um, exposure, smoking, secondhand smoke, family history. Yes. What are the types of – I know this is quick, but I feel we should review a little bit. Types of lung cancer, small cell versus not small cell, and squamous cell is the most com is a common one, actually, and then, of course, the most common. Um, I won't get into that. Breast cancer is most common for women. This woman's a woman. She's a woman. Breast cancer is the most common for women by far, but lung cancer is a lot more deadly for women. So if let's just say the first time if we didn't know this patient had lung cancer and you have a primary metastatic tumor of the bone, uh, Jessica, how do you work that patient up? So the patient shows up with a T12 metastatic lesion. What do you do with that patient? So uh, you have to do kind of a broad-based um, history and physical. Um, you start with uh, imaging such as a chest X-ray and a CT chest X-ray pelvis and basic labs, including CBC, BMP, ESR, CRP, um, SPEP, and calcium. Um, and all that's done before biopsy. Um, you have with the radiographic workup, you can identify the primary tumor in 85% percent um, cases. With the workup, right. And then the, and the biopsy just gives you 8%. So this is from Rugraf's article and a triple phase bone scan. And you can use that if you want. So why do you do this radiographic workup? Make sure it's not a solitary sarcoma of bone, which the, the classic case is somebody has a femur, femoral lesion, someone nails it, and it was osteosarcoma. It's a big problem. So make sure it's not a problem, which is very, very rare, but it is possible. Maybe you can find an easier biopsy fight, uh, site and make sure it's not renal cell because they bleed. Uh, avoid maybe you can avoid a biopsy and it may it can help the pathologist and you said the blood work calcium is very important I don't know if you said calcium yes yeah so I always, I always order and every single cancer patient I, or, I always order calcium the, I mean I'm supposed to but also my best friend uh, who was an oncologist his mother died from hypercalcemia from cancer so I can never forget it and um, serum protein uh, PSA for men so where do metastases go? <coughs> Lumbar spine and thoracic spine, uh, but also pelvis and proximal hip. Most common areas, lung, liver, and bone. And the cancer has to leave its primary site, uh, go into the blood vessels, leave the blood vessels, go into a new site, and then need more blood vessels there. So how, venous drainage, who is uh, Dr. Batson, Jessica? Um, I believe he was. In he was a pathologist from University of Pennsylvania. And what yeah, was his? Yeah, he discovered um, that he um, looked at the venous supply of um, the spine and discovered Batson's plexus. Yeah. And uh, do you know how he did it? I can tell you if you don't know. He um, injected dye in cadavers, and um, I believe he just watched where. Into the, into the dorsal vein of the penis, which usually goes into the pelvis and through the IVC. But if you pushed on the uh, chimpanzee's belly, which you did, um, it didn't go into the IVC. Um, so the pushing on the belly was like a valsalva maneuver. It didn't go into the IVC, into the liver, but it went to Batson's plexus, this plexus that he described. You can see it on the left, which goes into the pelvis and the spine with the valsalva maneuver. So <laughs> the most that's which everybody knows to the spine and the spine is the most common site for osseous metastasis <clears throat> thoracic spine is more common lumbar i'm not sure i think it's because it's more bone and we went over that and we went over imaging studies bone scan cat scan is better for bone okay so this is this is a um, question is this is a tumor uh that's compressing the fecal sac the tumor's on the right okay and it's compressing the nerves to the left and the question is, why, below the tumor, why is, are the nerves still deviated to the left? It's because it's one continuous structure, so you have a point of compression that still is. You know, yeah, so this, this is my drawing, yeah, because yeah, because the spine does, it's not very pliable. The whole thing sort of moves when you compress it. So I, I think this is why it looks like that. So I just felt compelled to uh, show that to everybody. So, so spinal cord, so should we do radiation, like... <clears throat> what uh, Justin was telling us. So tell us what, um, did you read Patchell's study? Yes. So Patchell found that... Um, From Lancet in 2005. Yes. There's, um, University of Kentucky. Mm -hmm. When patients were treated with surgery, uh, 
and radiation versus radiation alone. Um, patients not only walked, but they walked for long. Yeah, but it was, ran it was randomized. Yes. It was randomized. So they took all patients with tumors with spinal cord compression. They gave them steroids, randomized to surgery immediately or randomized to radiation. Mm -hmm. And what did they find? That the patients who had surgery. Better, they walked and walked for longer. Yeah, so they excluded like, lymphoma, leukemia, multiple myeloma, germ cell tumors, and primary spinal tumors because these blood these blood tumors are extremely rare sensitive, right? But everybody else, and they found, let's say, how long did they walk? Eighty four percent of the people uh, continued to walk at like I forget the end point. Twenty two days. One hundred twenty days versus fifty seven percent for radiotherapy. As far as uh. uh how long they walked, it was a lot longer, 153 days versus uh, 54 days for radiation. Surgical people, uh, if you came in and you were not walking, if you had surgery, 60%, 62% chance that you will walk afterwards versus 19% for radiation. How much pain medicine? The surgical people use a lot less pain medicine. Uh, mortality was much less. And if you uh, crossed over, um, you did better with surgery. So conclusion is, um, in these patients, it's better to do immediate surgery if you have spinal cord compression from a metastatic tumor. So I think it's clear surgery is better immediate treatment. And the people who did not have immediate surgery had a high complication rate. So in other words, if you send someone to radiation and then they fail and then you do the surgery, the complication rate is 40% versus 12. So I think it's very clear that these patients do better with surgery. Does anybody have any comments on that? Yeah, just just to uh, mention that if you look at the um, historic data and articles, um, there was a time when surgery was not being advised uh, when they compared laminectomy to patients who had radiation. They found there was no difference. And, and sur they just said surgery, but the surgery was laminectomy, right? So they said it was how they, they said is it better to do surgery or radiation? But the surgery was laminectomy. They didn't right. but okay. if you look at a lot of but a lot of the data showed there's one article you're showing this better official data. A lot of the articles were uh, showing no no better outcome. Why do you think that would be? That if you if you just do a laminectomy compared to to uh, radiation, why potentially you would have no better results? Um, maybe I mean you're not getting the entire tumor with your decompression or. Where's most tumors of the spine? Of the spine? Where, where are these? No. Where are most tumors of the spine? Uh, the in the material body, right? Okay. Oh, so that's not, so, that's not so the So they were doing a destabilizing procedure, mm -hmm. which was the laminectomy alone, when you had anterior, basically uh, anterior tumor or anterior instability. So the initial data showed a terrible result of surgery. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until people started using the anterior techniques of stabilization of, of the bulk of the tumor anteriorly or posterior instrumentation that you actually started to see an advantage. So they were doing the wrong operation, and a lot of that data was skewed towards um, uh, was it, you know, to a worsening result of surgery. But well, spinal surgery hadn't developed to this point. Right. And it was but kind I'm of his infancy, but yeah. That, but then as people start to understand that the biomechanics of the spine, the stability of the spine, the result was much better with surgery, clearly far better than, than just radiation alone. And one of the biggest prognostic factors for, for uh, survival is ambulatory status. So if you can get them while they're still ambulatory or get them ambulatory, their survival is better. Yeah, that was their endpoint. point. So you can see... Uh, 84% versus 57%. So it's a big difference for the surgical patients. And people want to walk. I mean, it's, it's really important. Um, so extradural versus intradural. Most metastases are extradural, 90%. And 15% have non-contiguous METs. So I think you have to image basically the whole neural axis. And they present with pain. So the treatments are chemotherapy, external beam radiotherapy, stereotactic radiotherapy. So I just wanted, this is an important, this is a nice article, Spinal Instability Neoplastic Score, where this was created, it was interesting, called the Delphi Method, where they took, I think it was 26 specialists, and they asked the specialists what, what are the important criteria for stability. So they all inserted what they said to the headquarters. And then headquarters took all that data and gave it back to everyone and said, okay, this is what everyone else said. 
Will, do you change your score? And everyone kind of changed the score again. So this is how they came up with a consensus of what denotes stability, which I thought was kind of interesting. And it just gives a point score for where in the spine, how much pain, bone response, alignment, bony collapse. And it gives you a number uh, for stability, which you know may be helpful um, for people to talk to each other. Okay, so back to our case. So what should we do for this woman now? is a recurrent tumor at L1. So I went back and forth with everybody. Does anybody have any opinions? Like, do we need anterior stabilization in this case? Do we have to extend the instrumentation? Do we do an anterior approach, posterior approach? Does anybody have any opinions in our case here? Recurrent metastatic tumor. Do we need a biopsy? I can just keep talking. So, I mean, I don't think we needed a biopsy. Um, we'll just send it during the pathology. I don't think it would have changed anything. I felt I should extend the instrumentation because it was close to the end of the instrumentation. I mean, the tumor went down to L2 and my last screw is L3. So I think if this tumor extends any further, it's going to go past the instrumentation. So I thought I had to go at least one level above and below. As far as anterior um, reconstruction, an anterior approach is very morbid for somebody. I'd have to do both sides, so I decided against it. And then I went back and forth of inserting a cage anteriorly. So going into the case, I felt if it was easy, I was going to do it. And we talked about cement. We talked about cages. We talked about allograft. I mean, I, I, I also uh, forward this to my partners. So these are all the issues involved. So on the left is my preoperative plan. Um, uh, the plan was exposed from T10 to L4, remove the previous rods, uh, replace the ones that are loose, resect the tumor. I was going to start at L2 because that was the first normal area. So just in general, in tumor, I just you start from normal and then you go to abnormal. So L2, L3 was normal and I went up. And, and during the case, we encountered a lot of scar. Here's an intra-op. So this, that, what's an elevator on the right I wanted to make sure that I had removed all the tumor. So that basically goes to the very top because I couldn't tell during the surgery because there was so much scar. And the last thing I wanted to do was um, SF leak. And the, and the tumor was very sticky. You remember that? Brad helped me with this case. It was very sticky. So I mean, add a spinal fluid leak to this woman it would not be good. Uh, so here's our post-op x-rays, CT CAT scan, L4, new screws at L4, new screws at T10. And we replaced the ones that were loose with one millimeter larger. And these are just my notes from the case. We lost uh, 700 cc's of blood. It took us three and a half hours. Uh, we gave 3.5 liters. And uh, you can see in the arrow, that's where the, the most of the tumor was. There was a big cavity there. And there was a lot of scar. We, we dissected the L1 nerve root, but just above the L1 nerve root was a terrific amount of scar. I mean, it was, it was, it was more than scar because it was radiation plus the surgery so i just i mean we tried it and at some point we kind of like brad and i said we made a decision i, I think we said uh, we should quit because it just it just was not coming off the dura um and we were left with a cavity and we could not insert uh, a cage easily because it was just so stiff from all the scar so we just packed it with allograft and this is just my new screws old screws so now, Dr. Beth, is there any questions about the surgery? I, um, just from the articles we sent out, I thought it was recommended not to use graft and to use cement instead in pieces of tumor. Is that like a prognosis kind of yeah. thing? Is that like you should use graft in a younger patient with a tumor resection? Or I mean, it's, it's about longevity, so it's not going to work. So, you know, fusions don't, the, the basic premise is, and we talked about the earlier today, is, is uh, fusions don't work because the patient gets radiated, has chemotherapy, is sick, is elderly, they're not going to live very long. So what's the point of reconstructing it when cement is so much quicker and easier? But you don't know how long someone has to live. I mean, this woman is, is way like 95th percentile of how long she lived. So you just don't know. So I think you have to weigh it on a case-by-case -case basis. What do you think, Paul? Or, I mean, it's no downside. Slight infection risk. Uh, yeah, it's negligible. So I don't think it's unreasonable to do that. But um, I think the fact that you had unilateral, postulateral fusion, it was solid, you probably didn't have as much of a need for anterior column support as you would if there was no 
fusion posture early. I mean, you already got over that segment, so I think you were lucky in that sense that the other side had fused solid. Yeah, no question. And uh, just as a general, if you got a big void in there, anteriorly, so putting some okay. allograft in there, I'm not sure it's, it's probably going to resorb. It's probably not going to fuse, but make us feel Something. good. So sure. um, if you could put cement, that's the old technique, the, you know, putting in K-wires over to your body and packing cement. And it's, it's called sunderism technique. That was years ago, but but it's hard to control the placement of the cement when you're, when you're squirting into a cabinet. Mm -hmm. Unless you've got to really control the borders, you can go anywhere. So he did, I think he did the right thing. You have, you have good stability above and below. She's an 80 plus year old woman whose prognosis is still not that good now with recurrent tumors. So he did the best you could. We tried placing a uh, expanded cage in there, but we would have. The only way we would have gotten one in there is if we had sacrificed the nerve root. The yeah, nerve if it was like T12 or T11. I would we definitely cut the root. I think it's worth it. Yeah. But at L1, I don't no, want to lose. Her, she would have significant weakness yeah. at that age, hip, and uh, did the right thing. Yeah, it's so important for her to be neurologically intact. You know. Okay. So, any other questions or comments? All right. Uh, so we're very fortunate that Dr. Beth is here to go over the pathology. So we also have the previous pathology. Right. I'll just go over that quickly. Okay. Yeah. So I'm Beth Allen. I'm one of the pathologists here. Probably talked to a lot of you on the phone, but never met you in person. <laughs> um, so going back to 2012, quickly, I believe at Upper Chesapeake, the patient had bronchoscopic uh, analysis, a bronchoscopic biopsy of the lung, bronchoscopic brushings. They were atypical, suspicious for malignancy in the lung, but not definitive. In the presence of a big lung mass, the lung came out, or the uh, tumor came out. Uh, that was the right upper lobectomy with mediastinal lymph node samplings done at the island. It was a squamous cell carcinoma. It was 3.4 centimeters. Lymphovascular invasion was identified surrounding the tumor in the lung, um, but all the lymph nodes were negative. So she was a pathologic stage T2A N0. And I believe it was a poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. And Say next slide. Next slide. Okay. <laughs> next slide. Uh, then fast. Oh, actually. Sorry. Slide, quickly. Um, so then in 2015, uh, this was her T12 lesion. It was initially biopsied at Upper Chesapeake, and it was called a metastatic squamous cell carcinoma. We do some immunohistochemical stains to confirm tumor types, and I'll show you some pictures of them in a minute. But squamous cell carcinomas are typically positive for the CK56 antibody and P63. Um, Squamous cell carcinomas are generally negative for cytokeratin 7 and TTF1. Those are markers that are generally positive in adenocarcinomas. Um, and then the tumor was resected. Again, a metastatic. This was moderately differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, next slide. Are there any prognostic indications like, you know, like the HER2 ER, PR receptor positive in breast cancer for the CK or any of the markers? for? Yeah. So, yes, they're not prognostic. They're just diagnostic markers to help us kind of subclassify tumor types. Um, so this was from her initial T12 biopsy. Um, so what you see here. Unfortunately, it doesn't work on the screen. I'm sorry. Oh, no. That's fine. I'll just I'll point. Um, so over to the far left and the far right, uh, you see a lot of pink material or eosinophilic material. Um, that's just scar tissue and all the kind of blue staining cells there to the right and to the left are inflammatory cells. Um, but in the center, uh, which Dr. Seiger marked with an arrow, we see this kind of very cohesive cellular fragment. So if I know I'm getting something from T12, um, you know, the other stuff, I think, okay, it's some kind of an inflammatory reaction, but that cluster of cells is very abnormal. So when we go on higher power, next slide, and we look at the cells. Um, so the routine stain we use is called hematoxylin and eosin. So it's kind of a pink purple stain to us. And that's our initial routine stain we do in all pathologic specimens. So what you see here, so again, we see this very cohesive cellular fragment. And when I look at the cells, okay, this is a malignancy. And how do I know that? Um, a number of things. The cells are large. Tumor cells are generally large. Um, the nuclei are very big. Maybe would this work if I went closer or? Uh, you know, if you sat next to me, you could just use oh, a laptop. Okay. So just like you just start. You can drive. Like Watch it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, just, you can just. You can actually. You can just use this thing. Right there. All right. 
So these are the tumor cell nuclei here, one here, one here, all these kind of large, dark staining structures. So the nuclei are also large. Another characteristic of malignancy is that the nuclear membranes of the cells are irregular. They're not smooth as in benign cells. So when you go over here, you see there's kind of a little like depression here. When you go all the way down to the bottom right, that's a tumor cell nucleus here. So you can see the nuclear membrane here is kind of clefted or infolded. Another characteristic of malignancy is uh, prominent nucleoli and irreg irregular nucleoli in the nucleus of the cells. Um, again, not all tumors follow, you know, these characteristics, but in general, these are the typical features of malignancy that we look for. So when, when a pathologist looks at this, we'll say, oh, these, are, these look like malignant cells. Then the next thing is to try to figure out what kind of malignancy this is. Um, next slide. I could probably do this. Yeah. Um, so this is our cytoke cytokeratin or CK5-6 stain. It's a cytokeratin. It's usually positive in epithelial tumors, which are carcinomas generally. When you think about malignancy, you have you know, lymphomas, melanomas, sarcomas. Um, so we need to determine what type of cancer this is. So again, cytokeratin 5-6 is typically positive in squamous cell carcinomas. So this confirms kind of the initial microscopic impression that it is a squamous cell carcinoma. This one here? Yeah. Um, and then another antibody that we do to confirm a squamous cell carcinoma is P63. Um, it's a little different. Some of our stains stain the nucleus of the cells and some stain the cytoplasm. P63 is a nuclear marker. Um, so what you're seeing, these oval structures, these are the tumor cell nuclei staining brown with the stain. And in general, when we look at immunostains, if a tumor expresses something, you see brown staining and the background or counter stain is like a light blue. Um, so again, this confirms the diagnosis of a squamous cell carcinoma. And then this was the resection specimen. Um, so again, this, so all you're seeing in this slide here is tumor pretty much. There's nothing normal to compare it to. Um, down here in the lower right, this kind of pink granular material is necrosis. Um, so again, this is a big nest of tumor cells. So again, a carcinoma forms cohesive cellular fragments of malignant cells. Um, and this shows nicely characteristics of squamous cell carcinoma in that they don't form glands. Adenocarcinomas form glands. Squamous cell carcinomas generally have relatively abundant cytoplasm. So here's like a tumor cell nucleus here, tumor cell nucleus here, tumor cell nucleus here. All this clear material is a cytoplasm. So squamous cell carcinomas generally have more abundant cytoplasm, and they also kind of recapitulating what normal squamous cells do in the body. They form um, keratin. So the cytoplasm, like especially in this cell right here, looks very dense and pink, and that's evidence of keratinization. Um, again, something that squamous cell carcinomas do. Why are those two different? The, 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 you said that last slide is a cell tumor, but clearly there's a grouping of, of okay. cells in the middle of the screen that are different than those squam the ones you were just pointing out to. Correct. So so this is all this is all tumor. Um, so tumors can be, um, in terms of histologic differentiation, you have well-differentiated squamous cell carcinomas, moderately and poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinomas. So this here, kind of to the, the right of the nest, it's still tumor. You have these very malignant cells. There's just less cytoplasm to it. So this area is more poorly differentiated. You can have different types of differentiation within one tumor. You, you can. And when we look at it and we make a decision, okay, what am I going to call this tumor? Poorly differentiated, moderately differentiated. We look at what the vast majority of the tumor looks like. So as I'll get to the current specimen, it was mostly poorly differentiated tumor. But then there were some areas that looks like typical squamous cell carcinoma appearance. So... Um, so I think I called it poorly differentiated because the vast majority of the tumor did not show nice <laughs> evidence of the nice microscopic features of squamous cell carcinoma. And sometimes you get tumors that are just all poorly differentiated. And then you're like, well, I don't even know what kind of tumor it is. So that's when the antibody stays help us. 
Okay, so another picture here, again, up to the upper right. This is some scar tissue here. These are some fibroblasts and a whole bunch of inflammatory cells, these round blue structures that are staining. Again, a nest of tumor here in the lower right and a nest of tumor here over to the left-hand side. Um, so again, as you say, you have these cells here. This is all tumor, you know, not as much cytoplasm, no keratinization. This is kind of more of a poorly differentiated aspect of it. In the center here, you have cells with more cytoplasm, and then this is keratinization here, this dense pink material, which is, again, typical of a squamous cell carcinoma. They generally do what's called keratinize. Dr. Seiger took a lot of pictures. So, um, again, fibrous tissue here, lymphocytes, a nest of tumor right here. Um, these cells with the asterisks here, these are not malignant cells. Uh, they are big cells, and they're what we call multinucleated giant cells. So following the arrow, this is the edge of the cell here with rather abundant cytoplasm. And then these are all the nuclei here of this multinucleated cell. I think in this setting, this is called osteoclast, which is a cell that we can see in the bone. Uh, it's not malignant, but it's um, involved in bone resorption and remodeling. Um, so I think that's probably what those cells are. You can see multinucleated giant cells in a number of different settings, granulomatous inflammation, but I think in this setting, those are probably osteoclasts. Um, again, up to the upper left, this is some bone right here, bony trabeculae. So you have, again, these multinucleated giant cells in close proximity. So I believe these are osteoclasts, um, you know, helping the bone undergo remodeling and resorption. And then at the arrow here, this is tumor right here. And then this is a blood vessel here. These flattened cells lining the blood vessel are what we call endothelial cells. And then these structures here are red blood cells. Um, this is very resorptive in her tumor. Is it because there's more osteoclasts? Are they working more? Is it just they're all working more or are they activated or do you know? Um, is that I mean, why you've seen them? Probably. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, I don't know, maybe I haven't just looked for them in the past, but I, I'm trying to think of the tumors that we've seen in the bone and whether I've seen this much osteoclast activity. Because mm -hmm. um, everything was very resorptive. You saw the CAT scan. How the bone yeah, the yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that would certainly indicate that the this... The is not just the osteoclast, right? Can the tumor itself the I mean, the tumor... Or does it have to go through osteoclast? Most, mostly activates the class, osteoclasts. The you, factors. Think, you think so? I mean, it looks like, I mean, there's, there's not so. many, uh, there's a lot more tumor than osteoclast on this slide, so I kind of wonder whether you get both. You know, I mean, whether you, the tumor itself can just, tumor cells can just resorb the bone. Yeah, I think it's a function of both, and sometimes tumor cells oh, can secrete you know, cytokines. Like, around every piece of bone, you'd have nothing but osteoclast. You don't see that here. Right, we yeah. Um, it's probably a function of both, what causes the actual destruction of the tumor itself, and then the osteoclast activity as well. But um, let's see, okay, another section of tumor in kind of medium power, squamous cell carcinoma, again, kind of these big nests of cohesive cells, which is again, a characteristic of a carcinoma rather than uh, any other type of malignancy, but certainly we like to confirm it with our antibody stains. Um, again, so here's, okay, so here's bone right here. This is a trabeculae of bone purple staining structure here. Um, there's tumor right here. Um, and then again, big, just a you know ton of tumor here. This is again, more, a little more poorly differentiated. You're losing the abundant cytoplasm. You usually get in well-differentiated squamous cell carcinomas. Um, you have a higher NC ratio. This is necrosis down here, this pink granular material. Um, and then I think this is the last one from the previous specimen, um, higher power. Uh, so these are lymphocytes down here, these smaller cells, um, get some fibroblasts, which produce collagen and, and cause the scarring reaction that you get. And then this is tumor here. Another feature of malignancy is mitotic activity. So you see a number of mitoses in this field. Uh, benign things can also have mitotic figures, but the difference is malignant tumors have what we call atypical mitoses. So they don't follow the usual like prophase, metaphase, anaphase. You get these wild looking dispersed uh, figures up here. So activity, especially atypical mitoses, also a feature of malignancy. 
And then um, lastly, this was the recent surgery done here at Union Memorial. Uh, it was a metastatic, poorly differentiated. Um, sometimes you'll see pathologists use the term non-small cell carcinoma because in lung tumors, um, kind of the, the big division, as you showed in your slide earlier, is small cell carcinomas and non-small cell carcinomas. Small cell carcinomas are neuroendocrine tumors, diagnosing them in a primary lung mass. Small cell carcinomas generally don't get surgery. Non-small cell carcinomas do if they're resectable. So anyway, you'll see that term. Anyway, and it was most consistent with the squamous cell carcinoma. Um, again, up here, you see some fibrous tissue and some lymphocytes. Down here, the pink staining material looks a little more granular, and it's necrotic tissue here. Um, and then again, in the center, you have this big nest of cells that even at this power, you can see these huge structures, which are the tumor cell nuclei. Um, a lower power shot. Again, this is kind of a more poorly differentiated area of the tumor. You have some blood or hemorrhage over here, and then just these big kind of ribbons of cells, which, you know, to a pathologist, you see this at low power, you know, okay, well, this is a tumor, this is probably malignant, then we go on high power to try to determine what type of cells are present. Um, just a few more. Bone over here to the right, these are some uh, bony trabeculae here. This is some uh, inflammatory cells here, these lymphocytes, and then this is the tumor over here. Again, the same growth pattern, very cohesive nests of cells. And then high power, um, again, the features of malignancy, you have large cells, you have large nuclei with irregular nuclear membranes. Um, there's some dead cytoplasm, which is, again, the keratinization typically seen in squamous cell carcinoma. And then oh, last one, very high power, um, just showing this is, so this is a lymphocyte right here. Uh, which is usually about seven microns. So on the, the microscopic level, these are, you know, very, very big cells. Um, so big nucleus, you have these irregular nuclear membranes, you have these irregular nuclei in the center. Another feature of squamous cell carcinoma is you have very well-defined cell borders. So you can see where one cell ends and where the other begins. And then just a few immunohistochemical stains. So a pancytokeratin stain is a stain we do to confirm the epithelial nature of the tumor is typical of a carcinoma. So it's positive for pancytokeratin, which is what you see in carcinomas of all types, adenocarcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma. Again, like the previous pathology, it was also positive for this cytokeratin 5-6. Again, a marker we use to confirm squamous cell carcinoma. And I also did a P63. So again, the brown nuclear staining are all the tumor cells that express this P63 stain, again, typically seen in squamous cell carcinoma. Interestingly, um, these two other stains, cytokeratin 7 and TTF1, are stains that are most commonly seen in adenocarcinomas. A um, couple things, you know, a lot of these stains, it's not 100%. You look at what the main staining pattern is to help you make a diagnosis. Um, so some squamous cells can express TTF1 and cytokeratin 7, albeit rarely. Um, another thing is once you have a diagnosis of a non-small cell carcinoma that's previously been a squamous cell carcinoma, sometimes tumors differentiate and form a little line of adenocarcinoma. There was nothing microscopic to suggest that. So this was just kind of um, a different staining pattern than was seen in the uh, original tumor. I think that's it. All right. Any questions? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, so when you say poorly, when you when you say in your report poorly differentiated, you just like uh, just a generalized description of what you saw, basically. Correct. So you look at the tumor and you determine how differentiated is is it? In general, how many of the cells look like a typical squamous cell carcinoma with those features? Yes, the vast majority was more poorly differentiated, but by virtue of the fact there were some areas that look like a typical squamous cell, you can say it's a squamous cell, but the majority of it is poorly differentiated. So this thing was the size of a golf ball, I'd say. Like, how many pieces do you take? Like, how do you know where to section? Right. So, um, so we get the tissue from you all in the lab. Um, we generally take some sections through it. Um, um, you know, if we have something that's, say, like, you know, six centimeters or so, we probably take three or four sections. Um, you know, we generally don't sample all the tissue you send us unless, um, you know, there's not, it's, it's a biopsy. Clearly, in a biopsy, we sample all of it. But usually, it's just kind of a, a feel. You're like, okay, well, I'll just take a couple sections here. Three um, or four. Three or four, I'd say, mm -hmm. yeah. 
All right, interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does any, does anybody, I think that's all we have. Does any have, anyone have any other questions at all about metastatic? All right, thanks everybody for coming. Thank you. Thank you. I love your colleague, Jeffrey. Pico or Idine or Pico? Yeah, great. Good job. Not too bad, right? So one more thing before you go is you have to pick the next one. Find somebody. Yeah. Thank you. It's better this way because you're prepared, you know, and you learn more. And it's, it's, it's more yeah, so get somebody, get somebody else. All right. Thanks, Jessica. Thanks for doing it.